And it's nice to have a friendly audience to stand in front of and make all the mistakes that you're going to make before you, you go out into the world. You get the idea. Um, sort of as a start, I, the title of the talk, Reality Straight Up, When Everything is on the Line, What Can We Really Know? is a little bit of a funny place for somebody who's an astrophysicist to start. So instead, I thought I'd just start with some astrophysics. Astrophysicists get to do kind of cool stuff. Here, for example, what you're looking at is a thing called a crab nebula. Crab nebula is the remnant of a star that exploded about a thousand years ago. When it exploded, the inner part of the star, something with about the mass of the sun, collapsed until it was so small that it would fit within the city limits of Mesa. As it did, it spun faster and faster, so that it's spinning now about 30 <coughs> times per second. Its magnetic field pumped up as it did that, so that now it has a magnetic field of about 2 trillion times Earth's magnetic field. It's such an extreme environment that energy is turning into matter and antimatter directly. It's flowing out into space at close to the speed of light, filling 700 cubic light years of space with a mixture of matter and antimatter that's glowing all the way from x-rays to radio, and it is as real as the grass in your backyard. Reality is kind of cool. Reality is a very interesting place, but reality is very often not quite what you expect it might be. Here's another fun thing. This is the image that I'm probably best known for, the Eagle Nebula, the Pillars of Creation, Hubble Space Telescope image. It's that thing that's over there on the wall. Uh, this is another cool thing. Again, what you're looking at here is a column of interstellar gas and dust. A column of interstellar gas and dust is about a light year high. Buried within it, new stars are forming. And in fact, if you could go back in time about four and a half billion years, this is what you would see if you looked at the region where our sun and solar system formed. So you're looking at the cradle of the birth of stars and solar systems like our own. And that's kind of cool. Astrophysicists do cool stuff. Not all astrophysicists wind up with their cool stuff on a postage stamp, though. So I get a little bit of bragging rights. For that. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys, I've met a lot of you guys before. In fact, I think I've met almost everybody in the room before. Most people have never met an astrophysicist, as it turns out. Something like one in every 100,000 people in the United States can claim to be an astrophysicist. Those are sort of small numbers. Which means that when you get on an airplane, if the person next to you discovers that you are an astrophysicist, you are the first astrophysicist that they have ever met. And they say, oh, wow, that sounds interesting, and they want to have a conversation about it. So that's just, so you take big, heavy books, and you try to hide in them. Yeah. <laughs> I wound up a while ago, I forget where the flight was to, but I wound up sitting next to a woman. And she got to talking to me, and I forget how we got there, but the conversation came around to her claim that she was a psychic. So she said, I'm a psychic. And I said, well, that's very interesting. Tell me about it. She said, well, the other day I was thinking about my brother, and my brother called. I'm a psychic. And I said, oh, um, do you ever think about your brother when he doesn't call? Oh, yeah, all the time. He and I are just super close. <laughs> well, <laughs> does your brother ever call when you're not thinking about him? Oh, yeah, it's great. We stay in touch. I always love it when he surprises me with a phone call. And I said, so you think about your brother all the time, and your brother calls without you thinking about him. Why do you think you're a psychic? Because the other day I was thinking about my brother, and he called. I sort of let the conversation in there, because there was no point to take it any farther. But the thing is, something that she did not understand, is that there are questions about which your opinion does not matter. She fervently believed that she was a psychic, absolutely certain of it. There was nothing I could say that would ever change her mind. The problem is, that didn't have anything whatsoever to do with whether she was a psychic. 
There are questions about which your opinion simply does not matter. Very often when we think we have answers to those questions, they're not really answers at all, but they're wags. Who knows what a wag is? I know Michael knows what a wag is. I really don't. You really don't? Who knows what a wag is? What's a wag? A wild ass guest. A wild ass guest. Absolutely. Fantastic. There should be an extra special piece of candy for having answers. <laughs> Often what we think are answers to real questions really aren't answers to them at all. Really what they're wags. They're wild ass guesses. <laughs> wags actually come in a variety of different flavors. For example, there is the I just know that it's true wag. That's kind of what the woman on the plane had. She just knew it was true. She was a psychic. She just knew it. Another wag is the everybody knows that it's true wag. Um, this one actually is, is kind of subtle and significant. Turns out that your brain is wired for the everybody knows that it's true wag. Humans are the go along to get along species, and there's a reason for that. We're social animals. So I want you guys to think back 2,000 years ago what life was like then, and imagine that you were part of a social group and you manage to get yourself kicked out of that social group. What just happened? You just cut yourself off. Okay. You know, probably you're going to die in a ditch somewhere ignominiously. Your survival, your procreation depended upon you remaining a member of that group. And so the reason that you guys are here today is because you had a long line of ancestors who were willing to do anything, say anything, believe anything, so long as they got to remain a part of their group. Because if they didn't do that, they wouldn't have been your ancestor. Humans are go along to get along. Another wag is the somebody told me that it's true wag. Yeah, somebody told me that. I know it is. I'm going to demonstrate this one. I want everybody here to think about something, someone, that you've known all your life from childhood. Someone that you care about deeply. Someone that cares about you deeply. Someone that would never, ever hurt you. Okay? Have somebody in mind? Everybody? Yeah? Okay. Now I want to ask you a question. Would that person ever lie to you about something that you think is vitally important? What do you think? <laughs> would they? <laughs> of course they would. Somebody told me then cut it. Quite often, you know, sometimes it's for fun. Often it's not for fun. There are an awful lot of people out there who are selling snake oil. Snake oil is that thing that they sell you because it's going to solve everything. And then in the morning you get up with a gut ache and an empty wallet. You know about snake oil. Everybody's selling. Question is whether you're buying. Finally, there is the I want it to be true wag. I really want this to be the case. I want it to be the case so badly I just know that it is. For example, I would like to lose a few pounds. And I would dearly love to think that somewhere out there, there was a miracle diet that I could just go and easily lose some pounds. Boy, I would really like that to be the case. And I want it to be the case so badly that I'm just sure it's there. And so I try one that fails, and I try one that fails. And I, but doggone it, there's got to be one. There's a $60.9 billion industry out there based on the I want it to be true wag of weight loss. Wags. A zoo full of It's just true. We know it's true. Somebody told me I want it to be true. What's the problem with those? No facts. None of them have anything whatsoever to do with whether something really is true. They're wags. Wild ass guesses. We go through life thinking that we know things. Really, we don't. Reality. Belief is optional. You can think whatever you want to. Participation, on the other hand, is mandatory. 
you live in the real world. The road to failure is paved with wax. In my career, I learned about this very painfully. Turns out I was a member of the science team that built the camera that was the first camera to fly in the Hubble Space Telescope. And I remember this morning extremely well. That's the launch of the Hubble. Uh, the science team was assembled out on the NASA causeway to watch the launch. And so we were out there. It was a beautiful day. There was a, a low layer of clouds. And so when the launch came, the shuttle went up, disappeared into that layer of clouds that lit it up beautifully. We were far enough away that it was some time we saw it going up and then we started to feel this incredible rumble of the launch on your bones. Despite the fact that you aren't supposed to have alcohol on the NASA causeway, we opened up lots of champagne and celebrated because it was a very exciting day. This project that we had all been working on for a long time and was going to do incredible stuff had finally flown. Here we are later, the telescope being taken out of the shuttle bay, released into orbit. A new era in astronomy had begun. Finally, the weeks of testing were over. We saw the power system working. Putting a control system stabilized the telescope. The thermal system put it at the right temperatures. The telemetry system communicated with the ground. The instruments swore. The doors opened. The levers moved. Everything looked great. We had a super telescope. The moment everyone was waiting for had arrived. Hubble was ready to transmit its first pictures back to Earth. expected to see in those first images were very, very sharp points of light. What we actually saw were kind of big blurry things. In fact, things that at first glance didn't look an awful lot sharper than what we could see from the ground. Uh, and we looked at them and we thought, hmm. situation where it would be graded science or canceled science, which is it? If this aberration was such a perfect textbook case, why wasn't it caught on the ground? NASA was in the firing line. It would be dishonest of me to say this, the mood of the scientist is uh, very happy right now. We're all frustrated, obviously. What are the possible things that could have happened? I want to follow up on my colleague's question to see how many straws there are on this camel's back. One instrument where we have a major problem, of course, is the white field planetary camera. It's prime science is going to be done in the visible portion of the spectrum. Uh, we feel right now that there's probably no real science that we can do with the wide field camera at this time. And I'll stop there. The wide field planetary camera, by the way, was the instrument of the science team that I was on. This is what you call a dark day. It's one thing, though, to see the press conference where it's announced to the world that your $1.5 billion new toy is broken. It's another thing to go to the movies to see Leslie Nielsen and look there in the back wall where you see a picture of the Titanic and a picture of the Hindenburg and a picture of the Edsel and a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> it's even worse to turn on the Tonight Show night after night after night and hear Jay Leno tells jokes along the lines of what sound does a space turkey make? Hubble, Hubble, Hubble. <laughs> You know that you've made the big time at that point. The problem is as follows. We were expecting images that looked like that, that showed about 100 times more detail than you can see from the ground. What we got instead were images that looked like that. We had problems. If you listen to that press conference, they asked the question, if this is such a textbook case, then why didn't we find it on the ground? What possible things could have gone wrong? There are technical answers to those questions, but there's also a much simpler answer to those questions. 
answer to those questions. Somebody forgot that there are questions about which their opinions did not matter. Somebody relied on a wag, and somebody paid the price. There are questions about which your opinions do not matter. There are wags, and if you follow them, bad things happen, and the universe just doesn't care. Stephen Crane, a lot of you guys may have read The Red Badge of Courage, which is a book that Stephen Crane wrote. In the last year of his life, or about a year before he died, he published a set of poems called War is Kind and Other Lines. I love this stanza. A man said to the universe, Sir, I exist. However, replied the universe, the fact has not created in me a sense of obligation. The universe is sublimely indifferent to what you think is true, to what somebody told you is true, to what you want to be true, to what your group believes is true. The universe just doesn't care. That's the nature of reality. Weighing five tons and measuring 43 feet long by 14 feet in diameter, the Space Telescope will give astronomers unprecedented views of space, unobstructed by the veil of the Earth's atmosphere. The 94-inch primary mirror, largest astronomical instrument ever to be placed in space, is shown here undergoing initial grinding and polishing operations at the Perkin Elmer Corporation in Danbury, Connecticut. The way that you make a mirror like this, if you think about it, how is it that you figure a mirror that's two and a half meters across? The answer is, is that you polish it for a while, and then you test it and see what shape it is. And you polish it for a while, and then you test it and see what shape it is. And you do that over and over and over again until finally you say, okay, it's the shape that it needs to be. If you're going to do that, you need something to test it with. You need something that will answer the question for you, is the mirror the right shape or not? The thing that I want you to realize is that here's this big fancy mirror, but whether or not it works, depends upon the prescription of this thing, which is about yay big, okay? Have that clearly in mind when I tell you about what happened. Things were tense. Kirk and Elmer and NASA were at each other's throat. It was kind of ugly. Reality didn't care. Kirk and Elmer was behind schedule and over budget, and reality didn't care. NASA was under pressure from Congress. You were always under, you guys know that, you were always under pressure from Congress. Reality didn't care. Everybody looked for reasons to think that it was all going to be okay. And reality didn't care. Feeling under intense pressure and scrutiny. Imagine that you're one of the technicians who's there in the room the morning it comes time to put together that piece of test apparatus that's going to determine the shape of the mirror. Okay, you have a feeling of that in your head? Your bosses are all over you. They want this done yesterday. They don't want to hear about any problems. This just has to work. It's just got to. And so you go to put this thing together. And when you go to put this thing together, has anybody ever put together a piece of Ikea furniture? Or, okay, yeah. What happens is you start to put it together, and when things don't fit, what do you do? You shove it, you shake it, you hammer it, you do whatever you have to do to get the thing to fit. And then you put it up on the wall, and you forget about it and hope that the bookshelf doesn't collapse someday. Okay, that's what you do with a piece of Ikea furniture. That's sort of what those technicians who were feeling under all of that pressure did the morning that they put this together. They put it together and they measured it, and the measurements turned out strange. To get it to fit, they literally had women opened a drawer, got out some washers, and shimmed it to get it to the point that the measurement was what they wanted it to be. And they said, fine, okay, all is well, and they went on about their business. Well, it turns out that this thing, by the way, is about an inch across. What they were trying to do was send a laser beam through that little hole and use it to measure the position of something behind it. 
But there was a little paint chip around that that left it reflective. And so instead of going through the little hole and reflecting off of what it was supposed to, their laser was reflecting off of that. As a result, they wound up putting it together with that piece in the wrong place by about 1.3 millimeters, about the thickness of a washer, and they went on about their business. That's a $1.5 billion paint chip. <laughs> That's a $1.5 billion wag. It just had to be okay. We wanted it to be okay. We were sure it was okay. So we're going to act like it's okay. The technicians felt under pressure in the eyes of the world to do whatever they had to do to get it done, and reality didn't care. When the mirror was done, everybody believed it was okay. Don't come down too heavy on those poor technicians because they were getting grief from above. It turns out that there was plenty of evidence as things went along for other people to figure it out. They had two different test lenses that were giving different results. And they just chose one of them and said, we're going to believe that. They took a wag. They wanted it to be okay. Problem is, that wag was wrong, and Hubble looked like the biggest screw-up in the history of science, and reality didn't care. Reality just doesn't care. Belief is optional, participation is mandatory, the road to failure is paved with wags. You need to care about wags. Wags are important in your life. The road to failure is paved with them. The obvious question then, okay, if you've been listening to this, you should now be sitting there quaking in your boots, realizing that knowledge is a little bit trickier than you thought maybe it was, and that it's possible to screw things up big time. The obvious next question is, okay, I came to hear this talk, what do I do about it? I've got three daughters, one of whom is sitting over here tending the camera. When they were young, for whatever reason, knowing their parents, it might make sense. One of their favorite poems at bedtime was Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky. It was brillig, and the slidey toes did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the poor groves, and the home rats outgrave. Beware the Jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub jub bird and shun the frummiest bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the knights and foe he sought. So resteth he by the tum tum tree and stood a while and thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whistling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker snack. He left it dead, and with its head went the one thing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O oh, fractious day! Kalu kalay! He chortled in his joy. In thinking about the jabberwock, it dawned on me that I know what that feels like. Eyes of flame, jaws that bite, claws that catch, the worst thing out of your nightmares, that's got to be something like discovering that your $1.5 million new telescope has become a joke on The Tonight Show. Okay, I recognize the Jabberwocky. The Jabberwocky is a wag. A wag is the Jabberwocky. So what do we mean if we're going to slay the Jabberwocky? How about a vorpal sword? If you're going to kill the Jabberwocky, you need a vorpal sword. You need some piece of magic. That piece of magic isn't really a piece of magic at all. We need a practical way to cut through self-deception. Groupthink, snake oil, wishful thinking. We need a practical way to slay the wags before they come up and bite us on the butt. We need a vorpal sword. Got a question for you. 
Why is it that we think we have answers to questions when really all we have are lags? Where do the lags come from? What do we do that causes us to hold on to lags? Well, what we do is we go out and we look for evidence to support our ideas. I know this, so what do you do? You go out and you look for evidence to support what you know. And when we look for it, we tend to find it. If you're looking for something to support what you know, by golly, it's out there, especially in the era of the internet. Take your favorite wild idea, go put it into Google, and you will immediately find dozens of web pages that tell you why it is that you're right and everybody else is wrong. And in fact, as a rule of thumb, put something into Google, see what the first dozen web pages that come up say is going on. Probably what's really going on is exactly the opposite, as a rule of thumb, such as the nature of the web. Francis Bacon actually was one of the great early slayers of lags. The human understanding, when it has once adopted an opinion, either as being the received opinion or as being agreeable to itself, draws all things else to support and agree with it. That's what we do. We look for reasons to hang on to our ideas. We feed the wag. The problem is you can't kill a wag by feeding it. You can't kill a wag by going out and looking for reasons to keep it. If you're going to kill a wag, what you have to do is something else altogether. Terry Pratchett, I just wanted to put up this very quickly because if anybody's looking for a fun series of books to read, go read Terry Pratchett's This World series. They're great fun. Here's a quote from The Truth. Be careful. People like to be told what they already know. Remember that. They get uncomfortable when you tell them new things. New things, well, new things aren't what they expect. What people think they want is news, but what they really crave is olds. Not news, but olds, telling people that what they think they already know is true. That's what people want. People want their wags. We automatically look for evidence that agrees with our wags. What's the problem? That doesn't work. That doesn't get you anywhere. That gets you $1.5 billion disasters. That gets your company in bankruptcy. That gets you whatever. So we've got to try something else. If that doesn't work, a thing to try is to take that and literally turn it on its head. Do exactly the opposite. Instead of looking for reasons to think that our wags are true, Instead, look for evidence that contradicts what you think and use it to challenge your ideas. Think about that for a second. If I have an idea about the world, and I really care about that idea, I want to know whether that idea is true or not. If I go out and look for reasons to believe it, I'm not going to learn anything. I'm just going to reinforce my idea. If I care about whether it's true, what I'd better do is go out and challenge it. Go out and look for reasons to discard it. And if I can't find reasons to discard it, then maybe I can hold on to it. Look for evidence that contradicts what you think and use it to challenge your ideas. If you want to kill a wag, attack it. Don't feed it, attack it. Put the verbal sword to use. If you do that, only the fit survive. And there it is. That's the take home message. You know, always when you give a talk, you want to be sure that people know here's the one thing that if you remember nothing else that you carry home with you. This is it. This slide right here. Here's the verbal sword. Here's the thing that lets you kill a wag. Knowing something doesn't mean you tried to show the truth. Knowing something means that we have repeatedly tried to show that it is false, but so far has failed. Knowing something doesn't mean that we've looked for reasons to believe something, 
reliable knowledge comes from looking for reasons to reject it and failing. There it is. Let that settle in. It is a straightforward idea, but when you really realize the power of it, it's sort of a mind-altering idea as well. It's a little bit, well, actually, this is not unusual. There are times when you do this. Anybody in here bought a used car in the last year? Anybody used car? Okay. I'm sure that the way that you bought a used car is you went in and you looked at it, and you said, oh, man, that's shiny. I love it. I'm going to ignore the black smoke pouring out of the tailpipe. I'm going to ignore the fact that the engine's sitting there going rattle, 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 rattle. I'm going to ignore the fact that the tires sort of look more like squares than they do circles. Because, oh, that's a shiny car. I like it. Is that what you did? It was pretty. It was pretty. Okay. <laughs> that's maybe not the best way to buy a used car. The best way to buy a used car is to kick the tires. Bounce up and down on the bumper and see how the suspension is. Rev the engine. Take it out and drive it. You always drive a used car hardest before you buy it. You push it. Because if it breaks, you want it to break while the other guy still owns it. Okay? It's the way you buy a used car. In other words, when you guys buy a used car, you employ the verbal sword. Really, all that I'm saying is that maybe you should be as careful about the ideas that shape your life and your future as you are about buying a used car. Slaying the wag. The code of the wag slayer. I think, you know, if you're going to have a sword and such as that, I figure knightly references is probably appropriate. The Knights of the Round What was the code of the Knights of the Round Table? I don't remember. I don't know. Anyway, the code of the Wag Slayer is always challenge and always put what is true ahead of what you want to be true. The code of the Wag Slayer. This is hard, by the way. The wags that don't really matter, those are easy. It's easy to get rid of wags that you don't care about. It's the wags that you really do care about. Those are the ones that matter in your life. Those are the ones that are hardest to challenge, which means that those are the ones that you have to work on the most. When you're slaying wags, you know you're getting close, when you start getting really, really, really uncomfortable about it. Slaying wags is not a nice, polite activity. Slaying wags is intellectually violent. It's bloody. It's brutal. You don't let a wag stay around just because it's cute. It's not what you do with wags. And the question that you have to ask yourself is the following. This is hard. It's ugly. It's uncomfortable. But can you afford to hang your hat? Can you afford to bet your future? Can you afford to build your foundation on an idea that cannot survive that kind of scrutiny? Think about that one hard. It's difficult to kill wags, but if you don't, in the end, you're the one who's going to pay the price. Tolstoy actually summed it up pretty well. Truth, like gold, is to be obtained not by its growth, but by washing away from it all that is not gold. That's the process. Everybody kind of understand now when I talk about the vorpal sword what I'm talking about? attacking ideas, challenging them, looking to see whether their predictions about the world are really the way the world is. Careful, because that vorpal sword has two edges. There's the vorpal sword that lets you kill these ideas that you want to kill, 
But the other edge of that vorpal sword is, suppose that I have an idea that you just really, really hate. You just loathe it. And so you challenge it, you try to attack it, and it fails. That every time you try to reject my idea, find the things wrong with it, it turns out that my idea actually conforms with the way the world is. Even if you don't like my idea, you're still stuck with it. The vorpal sword cuts both ways. You have to give up some favorites, and you have to accept some that maybe you just don't like so much. Because the universe doesn't care whether you like it or not. Slaying the wag. Let's think about it. What if those technicians on that morning when they were assembling the test limbs for the Hubble had actually had their horrible swords out and had them handy? And they went to put this thing together and it didn't fit properly. They wouldn't have said, oh, we're sure everything's okay, let's just shim it. They would have said, here's a reason to think there's a problem here. Maybe we'd better look into it. 1.3 millimeters. Can you measure one, can, can you tell that something is off by 1.3 millimeters with one of the rulers in your kid's drawer? Sure you can. 1.3 millimeters? Your eye can see 1.3 millimeters. If these guys had gone and gotten a ruler and held it up beside this, they could have seen that they were putting it in the wrong place. Okay? If they had thought about it for a minute, used their vorpal sword instead of worrying about, man, the boss is going to be ticked about this, if they instead had remembered that there are questions to which your opinions do not matter, if they had remembered that what they were doing was the figure of the telescope mirror itself, had they been at all cognizant of what was on the line, used their vorpal sword, history would have been very different. There's actually irony here, by the way, because it turned out that uh, when they measured it with this new device, it showed that it was a different shape than they thought it was. Really, you understand what was going on. They had to put it back in and do a bunch more polishing to resurface it to the wrong shape that the new corrector, the new test apparatus, told them they needed to. And so they were trying to save time and money and wound up spending time and money and in the process breaking the telescope. It's what you call false economy. Certainty is the worst wag of them all. Everybody likes to be certain. Certainly, certainly, the woman on the plane, my psychic friend, was absolutely certain that she was a psychic. There was nothing that was going to change her mind. Absolute certainty about that one. It's what absolute certainty means. I'm absolutely certain about something. That means that nothing could ever make me change my mind. Right? Good definition for certainty? If nothing could ever make you change your mind, is there any way that you could ever discover that you're wrong? If nothing could ever make you change your mind, is there any way that you could discover that you're wrong? No. If there's no way that you could ever discover that you're wrong, is there any way that you can claim to know that you're right? Once you say, I'm certain, what you've really just said is that you don't know anything at all. If you want to face reality on its own terms, you have to give up certainty. If you want to hang on to certainty, you can never do better than a wag. Sorry about that. I'm not making it easy for you. I know I'm not making it easy for you. But such is life. Facing reality means acting in the face of uncertainty. It's the way it is. Slaying the wag is a never-ending process. Even when you have an idea that has been challenged and challenged and challenged, you still 
have to keep your eyes open for the possibility that there might be reasons to discard it. That never ends. But it's by having that never end, by realizing that nothing is absolutely certain, that you actually manage to get somewhere. Now I'll point out, going back to this, you have to act in the, there's only one alternative to acting in the face of uncertainty. And that's acting in the presence of delusion. The fact is, is there is no certainty, okay? You might think you have it, but you don't. And if you think you have it, if you're just absolutely sure, if you're hanging on to those wags for all you've got, you're not going forward with knowledge. You're kidding yourself. To know something means that we have repeatedly tried to show that it's false, but so far have failed. A different definition for knowledge. So if we look at that for a second, what have we gained? Well, we've gained several things. We've gained a way to face reality on its own terms. We've gained a way to protect ourselves from wags. We've also gained a responsibility to wield the vorpal sword regardless of where it leads. I've done a really bad thing to you guys. Because now when you guys go out here and decide to just go ahead and hold on to your wags, now you know what you're doing. Okay. Before you complete ignorance, you can't do that anymore. You've given up some things. You've given up the comfort of certainty. Don't get to keep that anymore. You've given up the right to be lazy because you know what happens if you do. You know what happens if you let a wag get a hold of you. You've given up the right to settle for the wag. That's what facing reality on its own term means. There are questions about which your opinions do not matter. The road to failure is paved with wags. And the way that you slay a wag is by not looking for reasons to believe you're right, but instead by looking for opportunities to discover that you're wrong. Don't bet your future on a wag. Next thing, by the way, I pointed this out. This isn't easy. Is this something that you think you can just snap your fingers and say, OK, from now on when I think about something, I'm going to use the vorpal sword? Think this is easy to do? What if you say, I'm going to wait until it matters. I'm going to wait until that moment when everything is really on the line, and then I'll use the vorpal sword. Does that work? No. Because guess what? You don't know that that moment has come until it is already too late. Unless you've been using the vorpal sword all along, you learn about those moments when they're in the rearview mirror, and you're trying to pick up the pieces. So you're well armed. You know about ideas that your opinions don't affect. You know about wags. You've got yourself a vorpal sword. You want to go out and wield this thing. So I'm a psychic, OK? I am thinking about what happens in the morning when you walk into your classrooms and you gather your teams together and you tell them, I learned all about this wags, and I've got my shiny vorpal sword, and I'm going to tell you about how all of the things that you believe won't stand up to scrutiny. OK? Imagine that scene. Do you have it clearly in your head? <coughs> have it? Everybody got it? I'm a psychic. I, I could read your minds. I think it looks something like that. <laughs> what? You do that, and you're going to get your head handed to you. Because one of those questions about which your opinion doesn't matter is that if you walk into a room and start trying to lay this stuff out there, people are not going to be happy. It's called cutting off your nose to spite your face. When you play this game, the first thing to remember is to confront the idea, not the person, Okay, there's a difference. Because somebody's going to turn around and confront your ideas too. That's the way it works. Even so, to do that requires practice. Everybody in the room understand the game. 
They have to know that they're in a place where it's safe. They have to be in a culture that allows them to be wrong. That's difficult to do. And frankly, there are not very many cultures like that. But there is something that you can do that's better yet. Start with yourself. Your wags are the wags that you can work on. Your wags are the ones that you can start hacking away on with the Borgel sword. Matthew 7 talks about it fairly clearly. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Go after your own wags first, and you'll discover how hard it is. Confronting your own wags Using the Vorpal sword on yourself is uncomfortable. It is extremely uncomfortable. Has anybody ever played the party game? Um, we all have our, our personal spaces, right? Anybody ever played the party game of standing there talking to somebody and just kind of stepping into their personal space a little bit? What do they do? They step back out of it. They don't even know they're doing it. All they know is you've you know, they're uncomfortable for some reason, and so they step away. And so you step back into it again. And they get uncomfortable and they step away. You can actually, over the course of a conversation, steer somebody all around the room, <laughs> wherever you want them to go, just by sort of easing into their personal space and seeing them back away. It's fun to do. You can really do it. <laughs> Something that is not, well, it's, maybe it's fun to do, but it's a, it's a little dicier, is not to push on their physical personal space, but to push on their wags. That woman, the, the psychic sitting next to me on the plane, the more I talk to her about, well, gee, couldn't it be coincidence that you happen to be thinking about your brother and your brother called, and the more I did that, you can kind of probably guess how she reacted. She got hostile, she got defensive, she got angry, her face turned red, she started falling back more and more on, I just know I'm a psychic, I'm a psychic. I'm, as if by raising her voice, that could diffuse the arguments, okay? So finally, I think she said something along the lines of, you scientists think you know everything, and went back to her book. All right? That's what happens. Slaying wags is uncomfortable. And it is uncomfortable to slay your own wags. Do you want to know how you can tell if you're doing it right? You want to stop. You can tell that you're getting into the good stuff, when you feel really, really uncomfortable about it, when you would rather be almost anywhere else, thinking about almost anything else, that's what tells you that you need to keep going. That's what tells you when you're into a wag that matters and that could affect you. By the way, it's uncomfortable to kill your own wags. It is not as uncomfortable as that. It is not as uncomfortable as having to stand up and say that something that you have worked on that means the world to you, that your future rests on, is now in the dumper because you didn't bother to kill your wives. That's a bad place to be. Confront the idea, not the person. Begin with yourself. When it starts getting uncomfortable, you know that you're on the right track. And there's what I promised. Reality straight up. When everything is on the line, what can we really know? We can know that there are questions about which our opinions don't matter. We can know that the road to failure is paved with wags. We can know that the way that you slay a wag is not by looking for reasons to believe that you're right, but instead 
by looking for opportunities to discover that you're wrong. We know that it's not easy and that you'd better start now because if you wait until you need it, it's too late. And we know that the place to start is with ourselves. That's what we know if you want to face reality on its own terms when it really, really matters. By the way, some stories turn out to actually have happy endings. Every now and then, even a really major wag can be survived if you work at it really hard. Fortunately, Space Telescope is one of those. Beautiful mirror. It's got a lovely shape. It's wonderfully smooth. It's just the wrong shape. But because it's such a beautiful mirror, it was possible to build instruments that would use that wrong shape and still make good images. Hubble on his way, the astronomers wait for the first images from the telescope. Their day of reckoning has arrived. All of us were, were packed into this uh, not terribly spacious room around maybe one or two computer terminals watching as everything came in. It was an incredibly intense time. What was at stake was, for the most part, the credibility of the program. <laughs> quite a head rush, to be honest. And I think when I look back on my career, I doubt that there will be another time to compare with being one of the people to stand there in front of all of our colleagues and say, this time we got it right. Reality straight up. When everything's on the line, what can you really know? Thank you very much. I would be happy to take a few questions, discuss, whatever. <laughs> what do you actually do to fix it? What do we actually do to fix it? Um, how technical an answer do you want? Basically, you wear eyeglasses. Why do you wear eyeglasses? Because you see really badly. Your eyes have an error. Your eyeglasses have an error. It's just that the error on your eyeglasses is exactly opposite the error of your eyes. And so you put the two together and you get good images. Essentially, that's what we did. The, the mirror itself was a very fine mirror. It was just the wrong shape. You know, very, very smooth, perfect. It just didn't quite have the right curve. And so what you do is, in this case, you build a set of eyes that has the opposite error as the mirror. And that cancels out the original error and you wind up with a perfectly good image. So you didn't change the mirror, you changed everything else? Didn't change the mirror. Um, wound up building instruments that could actually use it. It's interesting, there was a, uh, there was a meeting, I think there were something like 35 different ideas that were put on the table for how you might go about fixing space telescope. Including things, people said, well, we'll just bring it down and fix it here and take it back. People tried to figure out a way to maybe put a big corrective lens over the whole telescope to correct it. Um, all sorts of crazy ideas. The idea that finally played out, that finally won and has worked since, is, no, oh, you just build instruments that have, a, that have the same aberration but with the opposite sign. By the way, coming up with the prescription, we did learn our lesson. You just flew a telescope, and that telescope has serious problems. What's your next problem? Think about when you go to the eye doctor. What does the eye doctor have to do? Yeah, the eye doctor has to figure out your prescription. How are you going to figure out the prescription of a telescope that's on orbit. And not only that, how are you going to figure out that prescription and be have enough certainty to warrant spending another billion dollars to go fix it? This time I did it right. Turns out that, that that test apparatus, they found it still assembled. And so they looked at it and they asked the question, what mirror would we have built if we used this to build it. 
And that was one way of figuring out what the surface was. <coughs> the other thing that we did is we took images of stars <coughs> with the actual telescope and we asked the question, what shape does the mirror have to be to make the stars look like that? And that was another way to get a prescription. Happily, the two prescriptions turned out to be the same. You know, that was people bothered to check the wags this time. They didn't go with one. They didn't say, we like this one, not that one. They turned out to be the same. Although I was standing there, I know for a fact that one of the chief engineers who was involved with that was standing there in the room with first light after the servicing mission. And when he saw it, he breathed and he whispered, good, we got the sign right. <laughs> Other questions? Comments? Yeah? I think one of the <coughs> one thing that I appreciate that you brought out is that we're, it's not a personal thing. It's something that if you want to base life on life's terms, that it's important to put that subjectivity out of it and really look at what, what is really there. And to be able to go through that, and one of the things that for me helps is the opportunity to talk it through with someone else who may or may not have been through or has, has dealt with a particular situation. So mm -hmm. that, I think, is really valuable. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. I, it, um, I'm an astrophysicist. My daughter who's sitting here is an astrophysicist. You've actually got two astrophysicists in the room. She lives this, by the way. She had to be sitting here for this whole talk laughing internally because her job is to sit between the Department of Defense on the one hand and contractors on the other hand and tell them both about their wags. Is that a pretty good description of what you do? Yeah, close enough. Uh, we were sitting there talking this morning, and she was looking at some of her email. She shook her head and said, I've really got to get another job. Um, it's, it, it, it's not happenstance that it's an astrophysicist who's standing up here talking to you about this stuff. Because it turns out that part of my training, part of my education, involves being able to do that. If you take most people and sit them down in a room with a bunch of scientists who are talking about something, you have to be careful because it's likely that their head will explode. Because what the scientists will do is somebody will throw an idea out, somebody else will say, no, that's got to be wrong because of this, and somebody else will say, wait, but no, oh, that's... And within two minutes, you will have taken an idea. Somebody will have put themselves out there. It will have been completely shot down, and the conversation will be going on. That's very different than you get in most crowds, where somebody says something, and everybody else is sitting around saying, that's really got to be bugged, but I don't want to hurt their feelings. <laughs> if you're going to play this game, if you're going to talk to somebody else, They've got to understand the rules, and they have to have learned to deal with the emotion of it. That's why it's so important to start with yourself. Because if you really get to the point that you can do this with yourself, then maybe you're ready to sit back and listen while somebody else does it to you. And when you can sit back and listen while somebody else does it to you, attack your idea and keep them at arm's length. Then maybe you're at a point where it makes sense for you to start thinking about trying to critique somebody else's ways. Other questions? Comments? All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate you.